I'm Jack Osmond, and you're listening. This is Hudson Hammond, and you're listening to. I'm Richard C. Hoagland, and you're listening to. I'm Art Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. We have an unidentified flying object. All right, welcome back to another exciting night of Dr. J Radio Live. Of course, I am your humble host, Dr. J, broadcasting right here on our very own Coast to Coast PM radio network. It's in syndication with, of course, Late Night in the Midlands, PSN Radio, and all the way in the United Kingdom, Deep Program Radio, plus whatever terrestrial stations are playing the show near you. Now, I know where I'm broadcasting from in the City of Angels, as I said, where it happens to be just past 7 p.m. Pacific time on the East Coast, where my guest, who if you haven't seen who it is, I'll give you a brief moment to check out all the social media sites. Uh, He is in the Eastern time zone, as is our webmaster, sound engineer, and much more than that, that's Tom. And of course, crossing the Atlantic Pond, staying awake in a studio, literally to do this show, uh, several nights a week, and then some, staying afterwards doing editing and prepping before, is my humble co-host, Johnny Webb. And tonight, we are going back to the basics. But, before I do that, I must acknowledge something, and someone. Today, I received a set of really amazing Uh, drawings drawings of an incident and I must say I have not seen drawings this good since Adam Ambrose submitted us a series of them but what Nathan if you're listening out there what you sent us is is tops what Adam sent us because the detail is amazing Adam if you're out there don't take any offense just you guys are both amazing artists but I gotta thank Nathan for these and everybody will have a chance to see them I either if they're not up for tonight they will be throughout tomorrow and of course in future subsequent archives now now we've already talked about who I wanted to acknowledge and I said we wanted to go back to the basics when I mean basics I UFOs 101 what is the number one household name when it regards uh, with regards to ufology paranormal etc uh, area 51 is probably the second but nothing beats roswell you can be living in a tiny village in greece or in rio de janeiro or uh, tunguska siberia in the middle of nowhere yet you name know the name roswell and we have never had such preeminent researchers as we do and have been on this show as Don Schmidt and, of course, his partner in crime, Tom Carey, who does a lot of researching, writing, lecturing, interviewing, and so on and so forth. He's very famous, has been involved in this field for a very long time, and I am proud to know him, and be his friend, and to have him on our show again tonight. So, the one and only Tom Carey, welcome back. Nice to be with you, Dr. J and Johnny across the pond. Nice to be with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Johnny, how you doing over there? Pretty good, Dr. J. Uh, good evening to you, dear Tom. And Tom, our other Tom, good evening to you as well. Look forward to the show. <laughs> now, l- let's, let's say, it for, okay, I have, I don't have it in front of me, but it was the first book I read uh, that you and Don, not the first one, the first that the first of the three that I read, which was on uh, the Roswell case. Then you had the second one, which uh, 
was basically about Wright Patterson. I really, that's when I had you on the show for the first time. The second time was to come back to talk about the first book. But now we have a new book. And I got to say, I love the people up at Warwick, uh, Kate and Simon or something else for always, you know, push, doing a good job of, of putting things together. But I want to talk about this Children of Roswell, which is a very important topic enough that you put it in a book. And let's not forget, everybody, the children are our future. What happens today, they're the ones going to be telling the story, you know, several decades from now, as are the children from july of 1947 so first tom let's let's just get to the basic why children of roswell what what is there about them and what led you to to write a book about them well uh two reasons uh, the first one was out of necessity the uh uh pretty much the only ones who are left uh are the children all of the principals uh, that were involved in 1947 99 percent of them are gone now uh, uh to put that into a perspective suppose uh you had uh, a an airman who was 20 years old in 1947 which is an average age for an enlistee uh back in uh you know for any army well if uh, they were still alive today, uh, well, next year they would be 90 years old. Mm -hmm. Somewhat 20 in 1947 would be 90 years old next year, which is actually the 70th anniversary year for the incident. So, number one, most of the, most of the uh, participants are dead. Number two... As far as the children are concerned, uh, we're talking about actually two groups of children. The first group uh, are children who were alive in 1947 and might remember something from the actual time of the incident. The second group uh, are children who were not alive in 1947 but heard the stories from their parents and continued the the uh, legacy and uh for instance i i am gonna give just just butt in here jesse marcel jr was alive and unfortunately his very last interview on radio ever was with me and we had scheduled to do one right after uh you know he, roswell and he went back home to montana and relaxed a bit and unfortunately he died a few days before that follow-up interview which is very saddening but uh, and, and it, that's the, the first type. The second type would be his children, right? Yes, yes. Uh, Jesse Jr., you, you mentioned him. Uh, he's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. He was 11 years old in 1947, uh, an only child. And uh, his father uh, was coming home from the, the wreck, the, the crash site with a car full of wreckage. And uh, it was 2 a.m. in the morning, and he said, well, you know, it's 2 a.m. The, the uh, m morning meeting won't be until 8, 8 o'clock. So he stopped at home first. Who knows? Maybe to go to the bathroom. We don't know. But uh, uh, he also wanted to show the wreckage to his wife and to his son and uh, his son, Jesse Jr. And we get this now from his son that... Uh, uh, he brought some pieces of the wreckage into the house and they spread it out on the kitchen floor trying to piece it together because it was all in little pieces and uh, they're trying to make sense out of it and of course they couldn't uh, they couldn't it was like a jigsaw puzzle but some of the pieces were missing they just couldn't put it together but Jesse Jr. told us that his father even at that point uh felt that the wreckage was as he said it came to earth it fell to earth but it was not from the earth meaning it was uh, extraterrestrial he even he felt it was that right away and uh so uh jesse also he described the different types of wreckage uh, that his father had uh, the most important being that uh, i beam that had this strange symbology on it. Uh, 
Yes. Uh, they thought it was, you know, anywhere from hieroglyphics to uh, Chinese or Japanese writing. They didn't know or Russian. They they just couldn't they couldn't make sense out of it, and it, it didn't re they didn't recognize it any as anything. And uh, that was probably his most uh, important contribution to it, other than that he Jesse Jr. himself was a stand-up guy. He was a ear, nose, and throat specialist. I believe he was a helicopter pilot, and uh, he did two tours of duty in Iraq yes. uh, in his 60s. So uh, he was quite a guy. And, uh, and a medical uh, doctor on reserve literally till his his death. death. Yeah. 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 And, but uh, the, the real key was to know him is uh, what a what a nice man he was. He was certainly not given to hyperbole or uh, telling untruths. I mean, he was an absolute uh, rock solid uh, uh, human being that uh, you would want to know. Uh, just a real, real nice guy. And uh, I had the f good fortune uh, of meeting him again uh, down in Roswell two years ago when uh, he, he wanted to come to Roswell one more time. And uh, unfortunately, when he got back home, uh, I don't know what month it was, but shortly after that, uh, he passed away. But uh, he was he was just a great guy. Terrific, terrific witness, first-hand witness. That's right. And uh, I, I, I should say that we're actually starting to lose the children now. Uh, the uh, daughter of Walter Hout, who was a first lieutenant and the public information officer at Roswell back in 1947, he was the one who delivered the press release to the local media that the Roswell Army Airfield had uh, uh, captured, as they used the term, had actually recovered a flying saucer. And uh, in later years, he was one of the co-founders of the International UFO Museum in Roswell. And his daughter, uh, Julie, uh, became the director. And we've, we've known Julie for many years. Uh, she died last year of uh, uh, brain cancer. And so the children are starting to go. And uh, we're now talking to uh, grandchildren now who are starting to, to get up there in age. So it's, uh, uh, you know, if I've been on the case for 25 years and I could see the case for the first time starting to fade away a little because our, our sources of information are uh, leaving us. Yes, and that's the sad part. Uh, and I, I recall one very famous child of the first category of Roswell was the firefighter's daughter, who's still to this day, unless she's passed. I, no, know, she's uh, she's still with us. Still uh, going. Okay, and she's she still cries because she was so traumatized. <laughs> at, what, was yes. it four years old or was it five when she? She at the she was twelve years. She, twelve. Uh, Whoa. She was uh, 12 years old in 1947, and uh, until recently, every time we'd bring up the subject, she'd start tearing up because of the threat that uh, one of the airmen, one of the officers from the base, uh, levied upon her and her family if they talked about this. Now, her father uh, was a fire fire chief. Well, not the fire chief, but a fire crew chief for the Roswell City Fire Department back in 1947. And uh, he and his crew had gotten out to the site before the military did. And uh, they saw the wreckage and they saw the little strange little bodies. And in addition, uh, one, of the, one of the bodies, I'd say it was a body, one of the occupants was still alive. So uh, the story we have is that there were two dead and one still alive at this one particular site. There was another site with two other bodies that were dead. But uh, he he actually uh, he actually talked to the live we call it the live one, and uh, because his family wanted to know you know where he had been that day, 
And he, he said, well, I was, you know, out, out to the, a crash site north of town where a flying saucer crashed. And uh, they wanted to know what it looked like. And uh, uh, and then did you talk to it? And he said, well, yes, yes, I did. He says, uh, I, uh, we talked to one another, but not like we're talking by using our, our mouth and our tongue and voice box or something like that. He said, we talked to one another in our heads, meaning uh, mentally. And well, then the next thing I wanted to know was, well, what did you talk about? What, what, what did you say? And I said, well, it was strange. He said, because I was, I was really worried about it because, you know, you had this crash and this thing is all alone and his uh, comrades are dead. And he said, uh, the, the, this being talked to him and said, don't worry. The, the message was, don't worry about me. I accept my fate. My comrades are dead. My ship is wrecked. I am stranded here, and there's nothing that anybody can do to get me basically back home. So it accepted his fate and uh, was actually concerned about uh, the fireman. Uh, his name was Dan Dwyer. And uh, Frankie, the daughter, daughter. also, yeah. besides hearing that story, she had a firsthand encounter with some of the wreckage. She had been in town for a dental appointment and when the dental appointment was over she went over to the firehouse to wait for her father to uh, come back to t drive her home well wh while she was waiting in the firehouse this uh, this uh, uh, highway patrolman comes in the, comes in the door and says hey hey guys guess what I got you're not going to believe this so he, he reaches in his pocket and he takes out a piece of this uh, this shiny metal and uh, you know what's so hot about that he says well watch this so he wads it up in his hand and then he holds it over the table and he lets it go he opens his hand and it, it unfurls itself and so it just sort of floats there very lazily and floats down to the table and they say wow you know do that again so he does it again and it does the same thing so then all of the firemen and then Frankie Frankie Dwyer Rowe Yes. Uh, she had a shot at it, too. So she picked it up and wadded, up, wadded it up. She says, it was like I didn't have anything in my hand. I couldn't feel anything. But then she opens her hand and out it furls, and it just floats down to the table. And uh, they tried to cut it. They tried to scratch it. Or they tried to deform it permanently. They couldn't do it. And uh, they said, well, you know, wh where did you get this? And he said, well, we, I got it from... Uh, some guy up in Corona, some rancher up in Corona gave it to me. And, well, that would be uh, Mac Brazel, the, uh, the uh, owner of the ranch where the thing first exploded. And uh, so, uh, so she was a firsthand witness to that and also the story that her father told her and, and uh, the rest of the family. So the Air Force, or the Army Air Corps, as was then called, they... They marked the Dwyers as some a family that had to be silenced because they, they didn't want this story to get out. They wanted to contain it. Mm. And uh, so the Dwyers were, were uh, targeted. And this uh, Air Force officer comes over the next day with uh, two other uh, sergeants. Uh, the officer was a first lieutenant. And he had a uh, one of the, one of these uh, billy clubs, I guess you would yeah, call it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And uh, so they took they took Frankie Rowe's mother into into the kitchen, and they the, the the officer took Frankie Rowe into the living room, and he started to tell her, "Well, first uh, you didn't you didn't see anything. Well, yes, I did. No, you didn't. Well, she wasn't going for that. So he says, "All right, I, I, you know, I, I guess I'll have to tell you that." Uh, you're, you're you're not to talk about this. You're not to ever talk about this. Otherwise, we will take you and the rest of your family out into the desert, and no one will ever see you again. I'll be picking the bones from your desert, right? Yes, yes. Right. No one will no one will find you again. They'll be picking your bones from the desert. I, I have a quick message here from you. Uh, this is from Denise Marcel. I, when asked her if she wanted to speak, she said, 
I wish I could. I'm dinner at a restaurant and I can't call without <laughs> having background noise. I'm so sorry. Would you please tell him I would love to say hello? And I said, of course. So uh, on hello. behalf of Denise Marcel, <laughs> hello to you, Mr. Carey. Hello, Denise. Yeah. Nice, great, great nice, to, uh, nice to say hello to you. I know Denise. Yeah. yeah, her and her brother. They're great. I, You know, and I've only, it was because of her that uh, basically I was working with Dr. Lear. I, I I don't know if you were ever there. It was actually Don Schmidt who had come to a few of this, the meetings that Bassett used to hold, the ET media groups. And so I was managing uh, Dr. Lear, his bookings, his, uh, his everything. And I, I made two documentaries on him before he passed and a lot of stuff, did a lot of legal work for him as well. And so with that, I, uh, you know, he knew Denise Marcel, so she's jumping up to give him a hug, and I'm like, oh, who's this lovely gal? I didn't know she had a boyfriend at the time, and he <laughs> says, oh, it's Denise, you know, here, nice, meet, meet her, and she's, he's talking me up, and then I uh, got to meet her boyfriend, I was like, ah, but then she said, her, I said, so, you know, how can I get a hold of you, blah, blah, blah. And so she wrote down her email in my phone, and somewhere she wrote her name. The last name was Marcel. I said, would you happen to be related to Jesse Marcel Jr.? Because uh, I knew Jesse Marcel Sr. was dead. Or I say, with, or to any of them, would you be labeled, labeled to, are you related to Jesse Marcel Jr. or any of the, uh, the Marcels that were in Roswell in 1947? She just says, yes, that's my father. Really? <laughs> so <laughs> that's when the interview came about, and that was her first radio appearance. And then I've had her on a few other times. Uh, and then, of course, Jesse has now taken up. Jesse the Third has now taken up yeah. the uh, new position. Now let yeah. me let me ask you. This is this is really important. This is something I picked up from your book that uh, I don't think very many people know. Only someone like you who really does his research would be able to find amazing stuff like this. There's actually a few things that I found that I want to ask you about before we uh, uh, get something from Johnny's well, too. Now, here, here's what I got. I want to ask you. What, tell us about this former NFL football player, pro football player, who was involved. How, how um, was he involved? I'm glad to talk about that. That's a chapter I wrote. <laughs> so, yes. Um, the uh, I'm I'm from Philadelphia, and uh, our local NFL team is the Philadelphia Eagles, and uh, they had an All-Pro defensive uh, back named uh, Tom Brookshire, and uh, he was a, he was like I said he was an All-Pro. Uh, he was headed for the Hall of Fame. Unfortunately, he broke his leg uh, in mid-career. Uh, it was a fractured tibia, so his career was over. He became a national uh, broadcaster for NFL games on Sunday with uh, another uh, former football player from the New York Giants, uh, Pat Summerall, and they were the top uh, uh, tandem for broadcasting NFL games in the 1970s. So uh, most people across the country know him from that, where in Philadelphia we know him for that, but also for being a great football player. Well, uh, I was down in Roswell a couple of years ago, uh, 2008. I had my wife with me, and we were I was trying to show her the sights of Roswell, and we were down at uh, this football stadium down there and uh, walking around and uh, my wife says Tom come over here and uh, there was a plaque she was looking at a bronze plaque in front of the entrance that had the names of pro football players that made the NFL that played at least one game on that st in that stadium down in Roswell and the first, it had the name of the player and then the year that they played a game there. Well, the first player on the list was Tom Brookshire. Uh, the last player on the list was Roger Staubach from the Dallas Cowboys. And a uh, couple names, uh, other names in between. I said, oh, my goodness. I wonder, I wonder, I didn't know Brookshire was from Roswell. 
And so I made a point that when I got back home, I would call him up, which I did. So I called him up, and uh, it was like we were best friends. For He was such a nice guy. Uh, he re was retired, of course. And uh, uh, he also started 24-7 uh, uh, all sports talk radio in Philadelphia. He was the one that started that. So he had like three or, three or four careers. And uh, his show is still aired today. Of course, he's dead, but uh, his co-host is now the main host. But he started that in Philadelphia. Very popular. And uh, so I called Tom. I, you know, and as soon as I mentioned Roswell, I said, do you, do you remember that? He said, oh, yeah. I, yeah, I remember that. Well, he was 16 years old in 1947. And he says, well, you know, in the summertime, my father uh, had, a, had a service station on Main Street in, in town. And uh, he used to pump gas for his father whenever he had uh, the time to do it. And he mm -hmm. got to know a lot of the fellows at the base. And he said, all of a sudden, the base went into a lockdown. It was like a curtain, you know, the Iron Curtain uh, had, uh, or the wall that Donald Trump wants to build. Yeah, yeah. Had uh, had encircled the base, That's and right. you, nobody was getting in or coming out. The only uh, traffic was by air. He says he couldn't figure that out. You know, all of a sudden, that nobody was getting in, nobody's coming out. And uh, so he's uh, pumping gas one day, and uh, about this time, and some of his, he, Tom was a three-sport athlete, baseball, football, basketball, at the Roswell High School, uh -huh. the Coyotes, and uh, some of his friends came over and said, hey, Tom. That was and, the same school, by the way, Edgar Mitchell attended, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Roswell High, so he was and, a Coyote. Uh, Yes, and Frank Joyce, who was a, uh, uh, well, it's the only high school in town. That's right. So, it's a very small town. Yeah. Like, I've never yeah. been there. I just know from all my so the, friends like you, Stanton Friedman, and everybody who goes every year. Yeah. Tells so, me about it, not to mention what I read. But anyway, proceed. Yeah, so uh, they said, hey, do you know what uh, Roy Tyner has? Roy Tyner was a welder in town. Mm-hmm. And he said, Roy Tyner, have you seen what Roy Tyner has? He said, no, what are you talking about? He said, he's got this really strange piece of metal. You'll never see what? anything. So he was able to keep a piece of metal, you're saying? Well, let me uh, finish the story. Sure. <laughs> I mean, this is like uh, this is like shortly after the time of the crash. Gotcha. Okay. So it's not like years later or anything. It's like the same time period. Mm-hmm. He says, hey, it's the strangest thing I ever saw. So uh, Brookshire says, okay, let's go over. I want to see this. Let's go over there. And uh, so they go over, and uh, Tyner's welding, of course. So he's, he puts his uh, settling torch down, flips up his mask. He says, what do you guys want? We want to see that piece of metal you got. Come on, come on, Roy. We want to see that. Ah, get out of here. We're not leaving till, I, till we see it. Mm-hmm. So he goes over to his desk, reaches in a drawer, pull, opens the drawer, reaches in, and he, and he puts something in his hand. He's, he's got his hand in the fist now. He says, okay, guys. So he he, he holds his arm out at uh, shoulder length, uh, shoulder height, and he holds his arm straight out toward the boys. He opens his fist, and out floats this piece of metal. Instead of falling to the floor, it's just floating there. Huh. So it's this, levitating. So yes. I, th I thought you were going to say that this was the traditional memory metal when he held it in a fist. It just well, really it flat. It is. So it it's is. memory metal that levitated above his hand? No, it, he, he opened his hand and it just, you know, it dropped just a little. And it's just floating there. Just floating there. And uh, so uh, they said, what, what, what is that? What? Do that again. So he grabs it out of the air. He wads it up again. Opens his hand and there, just floating again. Oh my God, I've never seen anything like this. So he grabs it again. Okay, guys, you've seen it. Get out of here. And so they're on their way out. And so Tom says, "Well, where did you get that?" He says, "Well, I got it from so and so, uh, who got it from somebody up at a there was a crash of a flying saucer north of town, and uh, somebody gave it gave it to so and so, and he gave it to me." So 
A couple of years later, um, I, t- uh, I talked to uh, Tyner's wife. Tyner had died, but his, I talked to his wife, and she said, well, yeah, he, he kept that piece in the seat under the seat of his pickup truck. He kept that piece under there. And one day he came into the house. He had, he had sold his truck, and uh, I, he had forgotten that the piece was under there. And all of a sudden, one day it hit him. Oh, my God, that piece was uh, where? So he, he comes into the house. He's like a wild man. And the wife says, uh, what's the matter with you? He says, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where's what? Where's that piece of metal that I had from the crash site? Well, don't you remember you kept it underneath the seat? That's right. That's right. So he runs out the door. He doesn't know where the truck is. So he finally finds uh, someone who has the truck. But, of course, the piece is gone. The piece is gone. So uh, that was the uh, that was. Oh, I I should mention that uh, this this. uh, Let's see. Last month when I was last down in Roswell Mm -hmm. for the anniversary. Right. Yeah. For the festival, I found uh, Tyner's old uh, uh, welding shop. It's still there. It's still there. So I took a picture of it because uh, I wanted to get a picture of many of these as many of these places as I could that were still standing. Uh, Brookshire's old uh, service station is gone. It's now a McDonald's and uh, uh, the house where he lived is gone and uh, but uh, the Tyner's welding shop is still there. It's now an auto park store but uh, it's still there. You know I, this is something really interesting I wanted to to, to actually ask you about uh, but before I do I, I see we've had a question that's been written it's a pretty a fairly long one so I'm gonna give it to the Atlantic pond the other side and uh, see if Johnny can shorten it up a little bit and ask it. Go ahead, Johnny. Okay, well, this one comes in from Daryl in Chatham in Kent on Facebook. Uh, That's in England, and he's asking um, Tom, there was a recent video released with a group of greys. One came to be known as Skinny Bob, but from the uploader came a few months later another clip which looks like a U.S. Army MP guards and other personnel, Army personnel, looking over a dead alien in a box or body bag. The alien has six fingers and toes and a distinct right leg wound. This alien also looks very similar to Ray Centilli's alien autopsy, where that alien also had the same wounds, slender feet with six digits. What do the remaining survivors say about the alien? Did it have three, five or six digits? What's the agreed known here? Was the there agree- more than one alien species in that crash? Uh no, the the agreed number of digits uh, uh, was four, four fingers. Uh, we uh, we don't know that the toes, or even if it had toes, because for some reason they we never got a uh, toe count. But uh, as far as the uh, digits on the hands, it's four, and they all had they all had four. Now, as, as you see, uh, go on, Johnny, quick. I was just going to say, as you see, we have a caller, but go ahead, Johnny. Uh, well, no, I wasn't saying anything. That was the question, and, and Tom had answered that. But uh, I would like to put my two penny worth in. I, I did see um, a video that was about um, Truman, and he was explaining about the Project Blue Book and that he, he hadn't personally seen a UFO. But in the Project Blue Book, they were showing... Um, and uh, bits of, of, of uh, data that was related to the seminars that were going on in secret with Project Blue Book. And one of them was talking about the Heinz 57 varieties of aliens that they'd found in 47 or knew about. And they also showed some photographs or what looked like images of hands of these aliens. And as Tom said, they, they looked like they had four fingers or three and a long finger. Um, and also that the skin was like web mesh and it felt, they said that it felt like um, uh, like shark skin. The skin felt rough. It didn't feel smooth. Can you confirm that, Tom? I've, I've heard that uh, we've had uh, a number of witnesses said it was, uh, tell us that the skin was like a uh, reptilian, like reptilian. Uh, you, know, you know, like a uh, fr- frog, something like a frog. Yeah, uh, that's that's the those are the only stories that I've heard of, of the texture 
of the skin. It was like a an amphibian or a frog. Well, a frog is an amphibian. So <laughs> it's ironic you say that because one of our very esteemed guests who's been uh, is a. I like. I really respect him because when he he uses a false name, uh, he talks about his experience. Doesn't want his family involved. Doesn't want fame or fortune or anything. And the way he describes his abduction with conscious recall, it says that he hates frog skin. And when they touched him, what happened was, is essentially, he said, remind, it was just so slithery, slither, li, slimy, uh, you know, like lizard. And it was just so disgusting, it, it reminded him of frog skin. So uh, that's actually a notion that, that you know, transcends to a lot of people. Let's yeah, get... the, uh, the only ones who ever commented on the skin texture, that that is how they described it. Uh, now, we do have 801. Welcome on the air with Tom Carey. Hey, thanks. Dr. J, this is Nathan from Nathan, uh, the man who sent the photos, uh, the drawings. I, you know, thanks again for those. Like I said, I add them out there. If you're listening, don't take any offense when I said that these are better and more detailed. But you really did an amazing job, and these will be seen. Uh, and I also, uh, we're going to talk about them when we have the open lines night to hear how you came about to draw such designs because they were very detailed about an experience that emanated from a bedroom uh, but I do want to take you up on your offer to draw some more f pertaining to uh, other experiences but nonetheless I'll thanks again and what would you like to ask or say to Mr. Carey well thanks for the amazing compliment and I will be more than happy true. to give you some hundred percent true. And I plan on yeah. doing something personal for you too um, but uh, Tom, I just want to thank you so much for all your investigations and hard work in this field. I think it's so important for the people to know about this. Uh, you know, I'm a contactee, and uh, I would describe the skin of extraterrestrial since I've had physical contact. Um, it is kind of like a frog or amphibious, but the best description of how their skin feels is like a dolphin. But a lot of people get the op that, but that's opportunity. Still, yeah, not to feel a dolphin. More people have a chance to feel a frog than a dolphin. But if you think about it, right, dolphins smooth skin, and it's sort of slimy yet because not slimy as it is smooth and and wet from the water, right? But yeah, it, it's kind of rubbery almost. Rubbery. Gotcha. Yeah, because that, that, that was a dolphin. Uh, that was another description. Um, uh, I think it was S actually Jesse Marcel mm -hmm. Sr. Jesse Marcel Sr. No, I'm sorry. It was uh, e either Jesse Marcel Sr. or uh, uh, Pappy Henderson, a pilot who flew the... Oh, some, yes. That's right. He flew the uh, B... Bodies. B the bodies. The, the bodies. Right, yeah. To right Henderson, yeah. Right Pat, yeah. And, and uh, he described... Someone asked... He described the bodies... As rubbery figures, rubbery figures. So, which is which is bizarre because that if, if they were really rubbery, and let's just say you could squeeze the hand all the way or bend it, I uh, if it was. Oh, here's another one. Here's another one for you. Another eyewitness uh, is uh, Marion Black Mac Magruder, mm -hmm. who was in the Air War College. He was a Marine Corps uh, lieutenant colonel. Was a fighter pilot in uh, World War Two. Uh, he was in the Air War College class of 1947-48, and they were flown to Wright Patterson Air Force Base in April of 48, which is like uh, maybe six months after the, uh, maybe I don't know, six not eight months after the crash, and uh, they were shown the live one. They were shown the wreckage first, and then they were shown the live one. Uh, the live one was in another room. It couldn't see the. The officers uh, who were looking through one of those one-way mirrors, you know, and uh, so when he was telling his, he had five sons, and when he finally uh, uh, told them about this, they said, "Well, what what did it look like, Dad?" And he he used one word. Mm -hmm. He he just said, "Squiggly, squiggly." Whoa. 
Interesting. Which to me it sounds like a rubbery type. Uh, a feeling. Know. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, now, we do have 20 minutes left. I was going to ask you, we have leeway if we can go a little bit longer because there's a few more things I'd love to get to ask you for, if that's okay with you, Tom. But let me let me go with this first. I'm just going to jump ahead. Who was Dan Richards? And uh, let's tell me about the secret cave and was it ever found? Yes, yes. Uh, yes, Dan Richards was a teenager back in 1947 he was sort of a uh what would you call him he was always in trouble he was a he marched to his own drum and uh he lived up near corona richard's ranch was actually very close to the brazil ranch where the crash was so he actually got uh, some pieces of wreckage he actually confiscated some pieces of wreckage before the military got there. And he had the, the, the area is rife with ca uh, caves. It's a limestone a sedimentary area up and around Corona. A lot of caves. So he had this secret cave, as he called it, where he kept all of his stuff that he didn't want anybody else to find or know about. And uh, he had things like... Uh, uh, army rifles that he had uh, borrowed from the, from the military he hid there and uh, the story got around that some of that wreckage uh, he had hidden in his cave now the problem mm -hmm. was uh, Dan Richards killed himself but in a solo automobile accident mm -hmm. in uh, let's see around 1950 around mm -hmm. 1950 that's had just just gotten his license and uh, he ran into a telephone call and killed himself so the question was where was Richard's cave and uh, was there anything in there well to make a long story short we paid a we paid a visit to the the, the Richard's ranch about uh, 2000 and I don't know 2005 something like that and uh, this uh, this is uh, there's a picture in the book. I don't know if you have a copy of the book. But, yes, uh, yes, I do. The picture in there of a fellow named Trinidad Trini Lopez. I'm sorry, Chavez. I call Chavez. I, Chavez. That's right. I keep, I keep calling him Trini Lopez. He's a guy that there was a. If I had a hammer, I think he did that. <laughs> Uh, it's a fantastic book. We have another question from our caller, Nathan. Go ahead, Nathan. Uh, sorry, Tom. I got off on that tangent about the skin, so I never really had to ask you a question. But my question was, based on uh, your knowledge, and I'm assuming you've seen the alien autopsy vi uh, video from Roswell, do you believe it's 100% genuine, or do you think uh, you know that we're not really seeing the true... 100 percent hoax 100 that's my that's my gut feeling too 100 percent hoax uh, you know it's funny you mentioned uh chavez i'm actually looking at his photo right now uh you know it's this photo from 2005 he's obviously still with us right because it was his father as you yes. said that uh well, with dan trini trini uh we had gone to the richards ranch mm -hmm. and uh See, uh, neither neither I nor Don Schmidt ever. We we've never smoked, you know, in our lives. I I've never smoked, and neither has Don. But everybody in that ranch house uh, smoked, including Cigars, the dog, right? Include including the dog and the little. Huh. And uh, the dog had his own smoking jacket. And huh. the, uh, uh, there was a gentleman sitting in the corner, looked to be about ninety years old. And every time he took a puff, his lungs lit up. <laughs> and, wow. And uh, so uh, it was not a comfortable interview. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we found out that uh, the woman of the house, they didn't know where Richard's cave was. They didn't know where it was. But Trini Chavez, he comes in. He thinks I'm a lawyer. And he says, are you a lawyer? I said, no. He says, oh, that's good for you because if you were, I was going to come over there and kill you. <laughs> and and Don Schmidt, who he always dresses in black. He wears 
uh, black sunglasses, black shoes. He looks like a revenuer. Uh, he says, and what about that guy? Is, is he a lawyer? I said, no. Okay, well, the same, way, same goes for him. So we were lucky to get out of there with our lives. And uh, so to make a long story short, we, we did find Richard's cave. It's been fenced off because it's not actually a cave. It's actually a sinkhole, a large sinkhole that collapsed on, upon itself. They used to call the, the, the big room inside, they used to call it the stadium because it was so large. But we got there, it had collapsed, it was walled off to the public, but I got Schmidt to uh, go up to the uh, entrance, and uh, I couldn't get him to go in, but uh, uh, he went up to the entrance and looked in there, and it, you know, it was 60 feet to the floor, but according to Bill Brazel Jr., he knew Dan Richards before he died, and he said, well, Dan used to have this, uh, he used to keep all of his contraband uh, materials in cigar boxes. And uh, he, he said, well, and he told us that he himself, uh, Bill Jr., had gone down into the cave some time ago, and the cigar boxes were there, but they were empty. They were all empty which led us to believe that the Air Force, the Air Corps, had gotten the story way back when and had gone there themselves and emptied the, emptied the cigar boxes uh, that, that held the wreckage. So uh, we couldn't find any, but we couldn't get in there either because it, the cage had collapsed, the, the uh, cave had collapsed, and you didn't want to take a chance. You know, maybe it, you know, there was, would do some more collapsing, and we didn't want to be there when it did, so... That's how the story ended. Uh, we believe that the the Air Force did get the re, did recover the material that was there, because Bill Brazza himself had collected a few scraps. He called them scraps of of uh, metal from the crash that he had kept in a cigar box at home uh, on his ranch. And uh, one day he was in the the bar at uh, in Corona, and he was telling the, you know, some of the guys at the bar, hey, well, you know, I got I got the cigar box, uh, you know, it's I got it's pretty full of all these scraps I found, you know, after a after a heavy rain, that's they sort of wash up, and I uh, I go out ride, riding my horse out there, and I see them, and I pick them up, and I put them in my cigar box. Well, the next day, we're now talking about 1949 or two years after the crash. He said the next day there's a knock on the door. And there's three Air Force, uh, one officer and two sergeants, maybe the same crew that threatened Frankie Rowe. Mm -hmm. uh, he says, uh, we understand you have uh, a, a cigar box full of uh, certain items. Uh, we'd like to have those. And Bill Brazel told us, he said, well, you know, I could tell that they were not leaving without that cigar box. So he gave them the cigar box. He never saw, he never saw it again. So uh, it, it leads me to believe that the, 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 the Dan Richards cigar boxes, that's where he kept his stuff in the cave, and uh, the Air Force got those as well. We got Shorty, some jump. more in, across the pond. Go, Johnny. Sorry, yeah, I know we're getting short on time, and I wanted to get as many questions in. Uh, Sean in Dusseldorf on Facebook, oh, that's in Germany, by the way, uh, he says test dummy mannequins are being confused with aliens at Roswell in 47. What year did dummies start being used in the Army Air Corps? That's, uh, I, uh, just, uh, just to let you know, uh, my friend in Dusseldorf, our book, Inside the Real Area 51, there is a German edition of it. Huh. Nice. There is that's, a, that, that's, a, that's what actually I, I have to say. I I, I got to get my hands on Roswell Dig Diaries. We'll talk about that after. But out of the three I've read, I really took a liking to, uh, you know, the the real Area 51 because honestly, from you know, don't judge a book by its cover. I just thought I was going to read about Area 51, and I was blown away about what I read about Wright Pat. I'm, I'm looking at the cover now. I used to take German in college. If I got this right, it's uh, Im, let's see, Im Interim der Waren Area 51. So that's... <laughs> in, that in should the be, real Area 51, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, to answer your question, they uh, 
project, uh, the projects that tested those dummies you're talking about, we call, we call it the dummies from the sky theory. Uh, they started in the mid 1950s, the mid 1950s, and uh, Project Excelsior, Project High Dive, Project something else, and uh, it's because High we jump. were getting. It's, uh, it's because we were starting to get, uh, you know, the, they were building the U-2 spy plane, which went up to 70,000 feet. They wanted to test uh, the parachuting from high altitude without actually using humans, so they used these dummies. And uh, so it's about almost 10 years after the Roswell crash that they started using these uh, dime store mannequins uh, for Project High Dive and Project Excelsior. Uh, let me ask you about this. Okay, the car dealer in Roswell. Uh, tell us why the daughter, uh, or tell us about the daughter who said she never saw her father as scared yeah. as she did that day. Yes, uh, Sue Farnsworth, uh, her father, Arthur, was the uh, owner of the Ford Mercury dealership in town, the very first one that went back to uh, Henry Ford himself uh, was still alive when they started that. Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 having been in Roswell last month, uh, 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 it's still there, it's, and it's still a Ford dealership. So uh, he, uh, Sue, this is now at the time of the, the incident, uh, noticed that her father had this strange look on his face that she had never seen before. It's a look of fear and apprehension, and it lasted a couple of days. So finally, uh, they they also owned a ranch. Uh, they had the Ford dealership uh, on Main Street, the corner of uh, Fifth and Main in Roswell. But they also had a ranch, a working ranch uh, outside of town, northwest of town, that they would go to on weekends. And uh, this one weekend, uh, after the it would be the weekend after the crash, somewhere around the I'd say uh, the 12th or 13th of July. And uh, she says, okay, Dad, what's the matter? There's there's something wrong with you. I've never seen you like this. And uh, he's, he looks around. Now, they're out there in the, you know, in the boondocks. And so he looks around. He says, uh, let's go to our secret place where they always would have father-daughter talks. When they wanted to have father-daughter talk, there was this really lonely place on this ranch. And so they both saddled up, uh, you know, they both could ride, and they saddled up and uh, rode their horses out there, dismounted, and sat down. And again, they're out in the middle of nowhere, and he's looking around to see if anybody's, you know, within earshot. And he says, well, Sue, he says, uh, uh, your father, uh, I saw something uh, this past week I wasn't supposed to see. Ooh. And uh, I was warned not to say anything about it, otherwise uh, that I would be killed and you would be killed and the rest of the family would be killed if I said anything about it. And, and, Tom, uh, and, Tom is still in London. Um, you know, Brazil, Brazil was... What's Brad Brazil. Brazil. Yeah, yeah, he was given a new Ford pickup, wasn't he? And uh, I wonder if it came from that same dealership. And uh, whether the money came from Brazil's silence on the case. Well, if he got a, if he got a Ford pickup, that's the dealership it came from, no doubt. Uh, that's a story and, and that he uh, was seen with a, a brand new truck after the incident, after he was uh, a, a, taken and was you know questioned in a. Well, he made he made a, he made out somehow because uh, he was a, a ranch foreman, and as they described him, he never had two nickels to rub together you know and all of a sudden he winds up he uh, after this uh, uh, event uh, he resigned as being the ranch foreman went back home to Tula Rosa and opened up his own uh, meat locker business now he never had any money at all where did, where did he get it you know so, well, uh, it wasn't, was, when did Truman pronounce that you know, there was a reward for anyone that can catch a flying disc? Was that after Brazil, or was it possibly made from that, that money? That was... Uh, Brazil, that, Brazil, Johnny. Yeah, that was a uh, newspaper, I believe, that offered a reward for a, uh, uh, a 
I don't know, a piece of wreckage. Flying saucer, yeah. Yeah, it was a newspaper, not not President Truman. Now, have you found the children of Roswell witnesses more talkative than their parents or other adults? I would have to say a yes because of the fact that uh, the way I've been descri described from people who were, uh, you know, there in that era, because I've been going at this for over three decades, uh, and what I found was that the sense of patriotism following World War II was so high that if the government said, keep your mouth shut, this is for the defense of our country. That's all you needed. That was it. That's it, right? And not, yep. not like today where no one trusts <laughs> anybody. Right. You know. No, that that's exactly uh, correct. Uh, uh, it's two years after World War II ended. Uh, our, our military was never held in such high esteem as it was then at, at that period. And actually, we, it was two years after VE Day, but not two day, not two, not even two full years before V Day, which you know after was finished after the Japanese surrendered on, on yeah, uh, Missouri. V, yeah, right? VE Day was in May of 1945, and VJ Day was in August yes. of 1945. So it's it's like two years, was, two years it. Was it the Missouri that they signed it on? Was that what am I thinking of World War One? Okay, Ab absolutely. The, I remember there was. It, it must have been the, the World War One, where, you know, the surrender surrendered on the eleventh day at the eleventh hour. Of yes, the 11th November eleventh. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I'll they never call it. That. They call it something else now. Uh, but November eleventh at eleven o'clock. I remember as a little kid. Uh, in Philadelphia, everything would stop and bells would ring and all that sort of stuff when November 11th at 11 a.m. Yeah, yeah. All, the, all the church bells would ring, but uh, it's not, it's, uh, uh, I don't know what they call it now, uh, if there's even a... a I, yeah, I haven't seen it. It's sad because you can't forget our history. It's too right. important. I, I, had an, I had an uncle killed in World War One. And there's a big monument uh, to him in Boston, uh, uh, an obelisk. You know what an obelisk looks like? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, there's an obelisk to him in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, because uh, he was one of the first uh, Bostonians killed in World War One. I. I never, of course, I wasn't alive then. But uh, mm -hmm. uh, my family, my father was uh, from Boston. He never talked about it, other than. Uh, Uncle Ted was killed in World War One. That's all we knew, but we never knew there was a monument until after my father died. And I'm going through his effects. There's this old, old photograph mm -hmm. of a crowd of people, obviously in uh, uh, the dress of the period or in the 1920s, and they're all gathered around this monument. And I could make out the last name of the monument was Carey. I said, "Oh my goodness! I bet that's Uncle Ted." Well, I. I contacted the uh, East Boston Historical Society, and they said, "Oh yes, that's that's Frederick, that's Frederick Ted Carey, and uh, killed in World War One. Yes, uh, and the monument is still maintained. It was it was erected in like 1923. It's still it's still maintained today. So I don't uh, we know. We got something from across the pond again, even further than that." Uh, so, Johnny, since you're monitoring uh, Eurasia and North Africa and everything else not in North America, please we, be my guest. We've got another caller, Peter, in Cambodia. Again, thanks for calling in, Pete. He's a, a regular caller. He says, uh, some researchers have suggested that Roswell was a smokescreen for another UFO crash in Corona and that human body parts were found there. Is there any evidence to the contrary to suggest that? Well... Uh, the crash actually occurred near Corona. It's actually co closer to Corona than Roswell. So uh, I'm not sure where the caller is going with that, unless he uh, uh, is thinking of it. Maybe the, the early book, uh, the Roswell incident, the first book, suggested that there were two sites, uh, one closer to Roswell and one closer to Corona. Well, we were able to eliminate the, the Corona uh, on, I'm sorry, on the plains of San Augustine, which is near yes. Socorro. Yes. 
uh, we were able to eliminate the, the plains of San Augustine as a crash site. So uh, the uh, Roswell, there's actually three separate sites associated with Roswell. One close to Corona, uh -huh. one close to Roswell, and one in the middle. And which one was the debris field on the on that's the, the that's ranch. the Corona one. That's the gotcha. Corona one. So the, the the other two were the actual craft or what was left of one and yes. the other one in the exactly exactly. Yes. Which is the one that was found by the geologist and his class classmates? That's that's a that's the uh, Barnett. That's the, uh, no, that, if you're talking about that, that's the Plains of San Augustine story. Oh, okay, see, okay, I, I didn't get uh, to. But there, but it also, what's really curious here, we have a different group of archaeologists who stumbled upon the what we call the impact site. That's the closest site. That's to what rock. I was thinking. It was like a little rock where it, it yeah, not rock or yes, a large rock that it sort of collided into, right? And they. Oh no no no! That you're you're. You're confusing that with another story. Gotcha. That, that's the old uh, Jim Ragsdale story, which was a, a, a you know, a fabrication. Uh -huh. This, uh, this, uh, what happened was that uh, we believe it was either an internal explosion or a lightning strike or something that caused the ship to explode uh, near Corona, and it rained down all of this debris onto the Brazel Ranch, all these little pieces of wreckage. And also when it exploded, it expelled two creatures, which came to rest about two and a half miles east of that site. And uh, we call that the Deep Proctor Body Site. So there's two sites. The, the inner cabin or an escape pod, something that was able to withstand the explosion continued on for another 35 miles and came to rest uh, much closer to the town of Roswell. And that's where the uh, two bodies, uh, there were two bodies and the one that was alive were found. So those are the three sites. It's, it gets confusing, but, uh, uh, you know, and it took me a while to figure this out. And, uh, it, uh, because when I got involved in this, we were still chasing the Plains of San Augustine story. And uh, we finally were able to uh, determine that that, that that never happened. Or if it did, it was some other year. But, now, uh, I wish I was able to get you on for two hours. But maybe when Don comes back, we can do that. Because there's so much more we'd have to ask you. So I'm going to start winding it down by first asking you... Which of the children of everybody you've uh, interviewed and, and heard about uh, both the first category, the children that were there, and the second children, as we made the case with Jesse Marcel Jr., who was a child there, but Jesse the third and Denise were children after the fact. Which of the children did you find most interesting slash the most important in your investigation of this I case. would say I would say of course uh, uh, beyond uh, Jesse Marcel jr. who's obviously very important uh, Barbara Duggar she was the granddaughter of Sheriff Wilcox Sheriff ah. George Wilcox and uh, when we first got started in the investigation in the early 90s all we knew about Sheriff Wilcox, uh, we learned from his daughter, Phyllis, was that uh, the event destroyed him. And we're thinking, why good? It destroyed him? How could it destroy him? I mean, he was a sheriff. He's seen a lot, you know. It, it should have just uh, been another, you know, something else to uh, handle and forget. But they said he never uh, ran for sheriff again, and he died uh, fairly, fairly young. And, uh, uh, that's all, uh, you know, that's all Phyllis and her daughter, uh, uh, her sister Elizabeth uh, would tell us. But their, Elizabeth's daughter, Barbara Duggar, mm -hmm. who, who was George and Inez Wilcox's granddaughter, that she gave us the whole story where uh, George had already died in 1961. Uh, his wife Inez died in 1978. And uh, we didn't get a whole lot of information from their two daughters, but we got the whole story 
from the granddaughter, Barbara Duggar. And she told us how George had actually gotten out to the site, uh, saw the bodies, saw the wreckage, uh, and, the, and the Air Force came around, and the Air Force used him. The George, the Sheriff George, you're talking about, right? Sher Sheriff George Wilcox. They yeah. used the Air Force used him because he was fluent in Spanish to silence the Hispanic community in Roswell who knew about the crash. So he went it's, around delivering the mm -hmm. "If you don't shut up, we're going to kill you." Ah, that, so that's what probably ruined his life, his career. Oh yeah, yeah, and also. Uh, the Air Force came around to the sheriff's office and they thought, oh, here, they're going to tell me what a great job I did. They're going to give me an attaboy. Well, they they put him in a hammerlock, shoved him up against the wall and said, OK, you're not going to say anything about this uh, other, or we're going to kill you. We're going to kill Inez. We're going to kill your children and your grandchildren if you ever talk about this. Now, this is the sheriff of Chavez County which uh, he had jurisdiction even over the area where the base was at. And uh, according to Barbara Duggar, they also, lay, a few days later, called him out to the base. And she, Barbara Duggar got the story from Inez, mm -hmm. and the, uh, uh, I, Wilcox's wife. And uh, she said, Inez told her that the, the Air Force called him out to the base, and uh, roughed him up again because he came back. He looked like he had been through the ringer. He was clothes were all disheveled. It looked like he had been a, in a fight that somebody roughed him up. Mm -hmm. So Inez, according to Barbara Duggars, believed to her dying day that the Air Force had done something to him, like a, uh, like had given him a shot or something, to cause an early onset of Alzheimer's, which caused uh, George. Uh, uh, Sheriff George to uh, die in 1961 in a mental hospital of all things and she believed the Air Force had done something to him uh, to, to, to cause that so uh, we got all of that from Barbara Duggar mm -hmm. and I would say next to uh, next to um, uh, Jesse Jr. Yes. And there's one other one uh, I won't go into his story but uh uh, uh, Senior Master Sergeant Lewis Bill Rickett, who really spilled the beans on his boss, who had been lying to us. His boss was Sheridan Cavett, a counter counterintelligence officer who lied and lied and lied to us. Well, Bill Rickett, who worked for Cavett, uh, gave us the full story of not only his involvement, but Cavett's involvement in the recovery and the cover up of this uh, case. Uh, now, unfortunately, since I've kept you over the past this time, I do want to ask you again uh, as I end the live portion and begin the pre-recorded uh, session of, of political talk with Dukakis. Uh, I do want to give a caller who called in late a chance to talk to you real quick. Uh, 951. Welcome back. Oh, yeah. This, this, Dr. J, thank you. Thank you for letting me on. I, I know you kept him late. Uh, Mr. Carey, thank you for for keeping this uh, this pivotal event uh, so interesting and and timely. Uh, yeah. And please keep talking to the grandkids, whatever it takes to keep talking about it. But I'm just I'm just wondering, has anyone ever tried to reconcile the I beam hieroglyphs with the yes. Rendlesham hieroglyph? Oh, um, no, uh, we. Uh, we did have someone, uh, linguists and you know experts in that, uh, try to decipher the the I beam uh, glyphs, uh, but they couldn't do it because they had nothing to, to compare it with. Now whether they if they've ever could you know because we don't we don't uh, we don't have the wreckage so we don't know what the the uh, government or the air force uh, has done on the uh, on the quiet you know. Maybe they have. I don't know, but I'm unaware of it. Now, well, I, it's just just something new. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Doctor J. No thank problem. You, thank you, Mr. Carey. Yeah, hang Thanks. by if you guys want uh, until after this gets unloaded and, and this starts playing. I'm um, unfortunately I'm going to have to hang up on you, gentlemen, after this. But I want to ask you, Mr. Carey, uh, this, is, this is an international program, as you know. You've already received questions from. Uh, you know, both sides of the Atlantic pond. So, 
I speaking to a big international audience uh, composed of young people and older people in their uh, golden years, diamond years, uh, believers, non-believers alike. What would you have to say if you had one message to give to everybody? Oh, my goodness. Uh, it's quite a diverse uh, audience. Uh, all I could, uh, I, I guess I, uh, I would like to say it really happened. Uh, we're 99% sure that this really happened. Gotcha. Now, with that being said, again, I want to thank you, Tom Carey. Everybody, remember, all you have to do is check out his books. Uh, and one of them I still haven't gotten a chance to yet. Oh, two year, two, you had a call from uh, uh, Asia. I, I, I should add, our, our books are also in uh, Chinese, Chinese and Japanese. So I don't uh, know if the Asian caller well, reads. They, we actually had uh, s you know, s somebody from South Korea. Uh, call in, you know, and call, and then we've had some somebody write a few times from Beijing, which I thought was interesting. So uh, they're also yes. in Spanish. So the Spanish, German, Chinese, and the Japanese so far. Nice. Oh, also nice. French is. Oh, we have a French one coming out, French edition. So and the links to all of these books, everybody. Remember, all you have to do is go to the website, which is the only name you need to remember. I'm going to keep pounding this to everybody knows this. That is Dr. J Radio Live, drjradiolive.com. Hit the books and videos section, find Tom Carey, and then, of course, you'll see the links to all of his books. You can also find the ones that he's co-written with Don Schmidt. Same thing. Just scroll down to Don and click on his name. We definitely have to bring Tom back and Don as well since John hasn't been here since we've done the uh, new uh, the real Roswell air real it's not real Roswell real air 51 uh, book release interview which I thought was really fantastic then I want to give some shout outs uh, thank you uh, Dan uh, for calling in and thank you for uh, choosing to moderate the centralized chat room now I want to explain uh, acknowledge everybody out there who's had the frustration we are still continuing to use all the social media uh, outlets to monitor questions including the dozens of chat rooms that I've found on Facebook and that I'm aware of alone let alone that I'm not aware of actually more like two and a half dozen uh, but we're trying to make a centralized one that Dan will be monitoring which will be on the site and we're looking for a good solution a, the best solution which will be up next week I also want to re remind you all to uh, check this out the archives with some awesome you know uh, scenery and imagery and a lot of them have videos from the one and only Jaime Masan that were vetted to show that whatever was in the sky was in the sky it wasn't hoax now what it is that's a different story but the point is is he sent them to laboratories spoke to witnesses uh, knocked on doors in all the area to find people to corroborate the story that had nothing to do with the actual videos etc so there's some fantastic things that you guys will get to see again what is that name youtube.com slash Dr. J Radio Live. And like I said, that is the name of everything. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Flickr, Tumblr, YouTube, Google Plus, Gmail, Snapchat, uh, what is it? Picker. Picker is one I didn't even know I had. Uh, Slack, Pinterest, uh, I mentioned our dot com, even the Skype to call into the show. That's one of the accounts. And there's just everything. So don't, and of course, like I said, the most important two you really need to remember are the YouTube and the dot com. But if you just know the phrase, Dr. J Radio Live, the name of the show, then you have it all. I also want to thank, of course, my team. Uh, there's a lot of cool people. First, let me give an acknowledgement to Nathan. Nathan, thank you so much for the artwork. Uh, that is definitely going to be used extensively if you don't mind and uh, maybe sometime I'd love to have you and Adam come on to talk about it together and I hope Adam if out there please don't get upset when I said these are better they are more detailed not to say you're not a good artist those pictures were fantastic as well and I'd love to see more from both of you but Nathan's are outstanding 
So that's thanks to Nate and John. Now I'm going to go from east coast to west, uh, actually across the pond, and work our way over here. Uh, first, of course, I want to thank Johnny Webb, who's staying awake this late to do this show, which is fantastic. And, of course, let's not forget Miami Tom, who's been uh, staying up doing the engineering and for those of you folks who happen to be watching this with the eye candy that we provide you, he has been also doing that as well. And, of course, I do want to thank, uh, of course, the guest, Tom Carey. And moving even further west, we have Kevin Scott and Lou Sheehan. And, of course, um, you know... Nathan and Dan, who are, have called, and, and Nathan did some great work. And, of course, the people I really want to thank are you, the audience. Remember, disclosure is in your hands, everybody. You cannot sit there and think that POTUS is going to do it or just actively read this stuff and watch videos on YouTube and think that, oh, one day we're going to get told the truth. No. Everybody, please become proactive. I was a passive researcher for 25 plus years until a spark and some inspiration from Preston Dennett, Linda Moulton Howe, and my good friend Jaime Masson down in Mexico who told me to do something and be proactive, which resulted in the show. Now, a couple other things. Don't forget <coughs> the networks. Ira Robinson and we also have, uh, you know, uh, Ira Robinson and Michael Vara of Late Night in the Midlands, Angel Espino, PSN Radio, JC of D Program Radio for carrying our shows as well. And let's tell you about some amazing specials. Don't forget that Watchers Bundle where you save like 60 bucks uh, or more than that is really cool. Uh, check it out. All you have to do is click on that link. Uh, we also have the registration of domains. Same thing. Just click on that link and you will get to it. And, of course, you will see that all in a minute. There's just so much more to offer. I, we don't have enough time. <clears throat> With that being said, uh, this is Dr. J, everybody. We have an unidentified flying object. I'm Jack Osmond, and you're listening. This is Hudson Harrow, and you're listening to... I'm Richard C. Hoagland, and you're listening to... I'm Mark Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. We have an unidentified flying object. All right, we are back with a very special guest. Happens to be, as I have told you and you've seen on social media, former POTUS candidate, Governor... Michael Dukakis, who also teaches at two schools, which is, I think, uh, it's so great in so many ways. But uh, let me first go back to you and, and ask you, since the last time we talked, we talked about transportation, we talked about health care, we talked about uh, even ISIS. Have any of your positions changed or are they all still the same? Well, I'm not sure I can recall exactly what we talked about the last time we chatted, John, but I can say this. Um, I continue to think that the president is doing and has done a very good job, especially given what he inherited back in 2008, 2009, 2010, here at home. I mean, this country is in far better shape today than it was when he took over from this disastrous situation that was handed to him. Yes. I'm still concerned about American foreign policy generally. Um, frankly, I don't know what we're doing in Syria, and I don't think most of us do. We Just certainly help certainly help to create a humanitarian catastrophe, exactly. which, among other things, has brought a half a million refugees to the shores of my family's home island, which is Lesbos. Yes. And uh, I just don't understand what we're doing in the Middle East these days. And moreover, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, he's retired now, the Honorable Paul Hellyer, former Defense Minister of Canada. He, you might have met him. He was uh, 
you know, in that era. First, he was in, in Parliament, then Department of Transportation, and then he became the defense minister. But nonetheless, we should he he himself and his family are taking in Syrian refugees uh, basically, you know, to to be humanitarian and to be a good Christian. But at the same time, there shouldn't be so many refugees if we didn't start this proxy war. And this is what, what leads me into this current question. So we have uh, all these uh, these candidates now. Six months ago, if we did this interview, there was there would have been several to talk about. And especially on the Republican side, I believe they started with 17. I have had endorsements from Republicans, Democrats, and Libertarians for every candidate except Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton. And going back to foreign policy, if the wall is built by Trump, wouldn't that be akin to the Berlin Wall? Sean, Trump is nuts. I mean, I got to tell you, this is a, this guy's crazy. Um, and moreover, he's dishonest. Uh, the wall is ridiculous. In fact, it's trying to deal with what is now a non-existent problem because net Illegal immigration to the United States today is zero. Zero. So the notion that we would try to build this ridiculous thing and get the Mexicans to pay for it is preposterous. But that's not all. The other day, he was in front of the National Rifle Association. Yes. And proposed national concealed carry law that would make it impossible for my state to protect its people, protect its law enforcement officers against what I think would be indiscriminate potential killing. Now, my state happens to have the toughest gun laws in the country, John. Mm -hmm. It also has the second lowest homicide rate and the lowest by far among the larger industrial states. That's not an accident. We're very tough on guns. Now, maybe Trump doesn't like that, but to suggest that Congress would override what the people of Massachusetts want and force us to permit people to walk around with conceivable handguns is preposterous. Not only that, but he doesn't allow guns in his hotels. So yeah. who's he kidding? That's right. Who's that's he right. kidding? And, and that's just one of, uh, I don't know how many ridiculous proposals that this guy is making. I mean, we don't need this guy in the White House. And, and here's the crazy part, is how is it that all of a sudden he's become, become the Republican frontrunner at the same time when we're, people are looking for unity in the Democratic Party and the unity in the Republican Party, this guy is splitting up the Republican Party. Uh, the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, will not endorse him yet. Or he says he has to find out some more. Uh, Marco Rubio, who he used to call Little Marco, uh, you know, he's. I don't see an endorsement coming from him. And at the same time, look at Senator Ted Cruz being called Lion Ted, coming in with the Bible held high and, and lying, and then, you know, tweeting or retweeting, whatever you want to call it, because I'm sure it originated from that camp, a picture of his wife with uh, Cruz's wife. I mean, you just, it, that took it to a, another level. This year, 2016, has, in at least in my lifetime, and... and I'm, I'm sure in yours, has never, ever, ever been uh, what we would call a traditional, real presidential election. Well, I might disagree with you a little bit, because I'm a little older than you are. Yes. See, I remember Joe McCarthy in the 50s. Trump is a minor leaguer compared to McCarthy. I mean, McCarthy had this country absolutely hysterical over the so-called communist menace. 
And it was a time, John, when uh, people were frightened, they were scared, they were hysterical. Um, political futures were destroyed when that guy started accusing people of being disloyal. And um, I'll tell you a little story about myself, just to give you some sense of what it was like back then in the 50s. I was this Greek kid from Boston who went to a place called Swarthmore College, a Quaker school just outside of Philadelphia, right? I had never been out of New England. Those were the days when you didn't jump on a plane and go places. I'd never been out of New England. And I find myself, I didn't know a Quaker from a Shaker when I went down there. Now, it was a wonderful four years for me. I learned a lot. I had a lot to do with what turned me into what I am today, which I hope is a reasonably decent man. And I became active politically on the Swarthmore campus, I was involved. I was drafted six months after I graduated in June of 1955 and arrived at Fort Dix, New Jersey. And three days after I got there, I had what passed for a personnel interview. And I was interviewed by a personnel specialist, another draftee, who had a file. You ready for this? Yes. Had a file, every single political activity that I had ever engaged in at Swarthmore College. And if he had a file on me, it must have had a file on hundreds of thousands of people. And he said to me, I see you ran a fundraising drive at the American Civil Liberties Union while you were in Swarthmore. I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I did. And you were the chairman of Students for Democratic Action, which was the student wing of the ADA at the time, which was a liberal democratic organization. By the way, I succeeded in that capacity by a guy named Carl Levin, who just served <laughs> for 18 years in the, in the United States Senate and with great distinction. And he had that in the file. Well, fortunately, he didn't recommend me for another than honorable discharge, which in some cases they were doing. He sent me to Korea instead. Where do you think they got that information? How do you think he had that information? The FBI had a tap on the Swarthmore switchboard. Great. It was recording every single telephone conversation that went through that switchboard. In those days, we didn't have cell phones. We didn't have individual phones. Every phone call you made on that campus went through the switchboard. What do you think of that? That was the McCarthy era, let me tell you. And it was pretty scary. So... I find myself appalled by what we're hearing from this guy, Trump. But um, we've gone through this before. Unfortunately, we've come out of the other side, and I hope and expect that we will do so again. I'm actually glad you told me this, because, first of all, if we don't understand our history, we are doomed to repeat it. This is why I pay extra special close attention to people that are in their uh, golden years, diamond years, because they can pass down lessons that they learned so us and, and the next generation below me can learn. So thank you for that. Uh, let me throw in one little... Remember what uh, the Greek said? Remember what the Greek ba said? Bathima, Mathima. Bathima. Things happen, we learn. we're supposed to learn from them. That's why uh, we study history. Here's something I forgot to actually mention. Uh, this is just an uh, off note, but this is uh, about you. And I've been meaning to tell you this for quite some time. I'm, may, I'm sure you remember this. I believe it was two reporters in the island of Crete, or in Greek we'd say Crete. And what one said is, wouldn't it be great if the world was run by two Greeks? And then the other reporter said, yes, two Greeks named Michael, because Gorbachev was, you know, had uh, had some Greek in his system. You know, he was Greek. Only his name in Russian is Mikhail, right? That's right. Which is Jack, exactly the way we pronounce Michael in Greek. Yes, yes. I, I just thought I, I had to tell you that. I definitely had to tell yeah. you that. So... Aside from, uh, let me go back to this now, actually, because I've had every other candidate endorsed and then drop out, except the two front runners between Bernie and Hillary, who would you vote for? Oh, I'm with Hillary. Okay, got you. So Me and I are both with Hillary, have been from the beginning. Do you see... The fact that Bernie Sanders mentions himself as a socialist as a problem, because uh, according to me, again, you know, you, you've lived, uh, you've outlived me definitely by, you know, uh, 
two years. Ha, yeah, several years. The point I'm trying to get at is the last time I heard of someone saying, yes, I'm forming a socialist party. It's not going to be the Communist Party or Democratic Party was Adolf Hitler. And look what happened then. We went to war. I'll say. Yeah. Um, look, I think the problem with Bernie as a socialist is a political one. I mean, his views are not inconsistent with lots and lots of liberal Democrats in this country. But if you want to call yourself a socialist, and if you want to make speeches as he did about what a great guy Fidel Castro is, uh, that's not exactly going to p- play very well if you're the nominee. That's my concern about the Senate. I admire a lot of what he's doing. I think his presence in this campaign has been important. I think he's made Hillary a better candidate. I think he's helped to, sharp, helped to sharpen the issues, and I think those are good things. I'd be very concerned, John, about him as a final campaign. I mean, the fact that he's a few points ahead of Hillary against Trump in these polls doesn't persuade me, because I learned, unfortunately, painfully, that there are really two campaigns. One is the primary, and one is the final. That's right. And the second one is very different from the first. And I think uh, his socialism, if you will, and some of the positions he's taken, and the, and the things he's said in the past, would be very difficult to defend in the final election, and trust me, the opposition would have a field day. So I think that's been my great concern. It's one of the reasons why I happen to be for Hillary Clinton, apart from the fact that we've known her for years and years and have a lot of respect for her and think she'd be a fine president. That's right. She was first lady and had a lot of active roles as opposed to other first ladies in the past. She served as senator and then secretary of state. Uh, Now, we need unification in this country, not just from each party, wouldn't it be great? I mean, I'm not saying to do away with, you know, different parties, but ultimately, an American is an American is an American. I, you know, you, you yes, beliefs differ, but in order for us to accomplish things, we can't separate them like, for instance, the wall, you know, separating the U.S. from Mexico. Well, why are... Why are these candidates doing, especially, I guess, candidate, doing so much to separate and not unify his own party, let alone the country? I can't answer that question, John. All I know is this. uh, As a guy who was in public life for many, many years and was governor of my state for 12, um, and it took a while. I learned over time that when you bring people together, Mm -hmm. and you can do that as a governor, you can certainly do it as a president, when you bring people together and say, look, can we first agree on what the problem is? If you can get people to agree on what the problem is, you're halfway to a solution. Let me give you one quick example. Uh, Healthcare, which has obviously been a big issue during the Obama presidency. Um, if you went out tomorrow and took a poll and asked the American people, should working Americans and their families have decent, affordable health care, what do you think the numbers would look like? I, 93% of the American people would say yes. Exactly. And the overwhelming majority of people without health insurance in this country, before the Affordable Care Act, were working Americans and their families. They weren't loafing. They weren't sitting around. They weren't on welfare. If you're on public assistance in this country, you get Medicaid. These were working Americans, overwhelmingly, 80 to 85 percent of them. Now, now, let me a- ask you this about... If we can get agreement that uh-huh. working Americans and their families should have decent, affordable health care, then it seems to me we ought to be able to come up with an answer which will provide them and their families with decent, affordable health care. And uh, that's the kind of thing you look for. Now, look, I was able to do it pretty successfully... As a governor, unfortunately, I never had the chance to try to do it as as a president. But I think, and I think President Obama started his administration with this attitude. Clearly, I mean, he's he's a he's a, he's a, a born consensus builder. Um, unfortunately, we had some tough 
he has some tough opposition. But uh, I hope we'll have a president beginning next year who will approach the job in the same way, attempting to create and build consensus and find common ground. Obviously, I don't think this guy Trump is the guy to do it. I mean, he's going to be—he'd be a very divisive, uh, a very difficult and contentious president. I mean, we don't need that, but we do need people who understand how you try to bring folks together and get agreement. And that's what I hope we're going to get if Hillary Clinton is president of the United States. And now, I'm glad you brought up the health care that you implemented in Massachusetts. What can, I, I don't know if Obama can do it in the rest uh, of his term, uh, or uh, say the beginning of Hillary's term, uh, assuming she wins, which polls show that she will, what can we do to get this working right the same way you did? Because the way it is now, after it was implemented where they would uh, fine you through uh, from taxes if you didn't have it, my insurance literally went up 1,400% because I got it in 2004 uh, after, uh, you know, when I was on my own and I had no other means uh, unless I took uh, a jobs offer uh, that included benefits, but I'd rather, right. you know, started paying uh, $45 on my own, and now we're over 700 you know, plus a month, and it's because they want me to get out of that plan to get into one of the new plans, which has extremely high deductibles. So the way I look at it as just a consumer is that it's not universal so much as it is a cartel uh, of, you know, uh, HMOs and health insurance companies. What can be done from your experience that the future president or the current president can do uh, with, of course, the Senate and the House to actually Go along with this and, and and get this right the same way as the United Kingdom and other countries have. Well, I'm not sure the United States would opt for something like what the Brits have. Um, essentially, they have a national VA. And don't get me wrong, the VA healthcare system, despite taking a few knocks recently, is a very good healthcare system. I don't think the United States would support that. But if you look John, at the other healthcare systems in all of the advanced industrial na nations, and they, they vary enormously. There's one common factor. They all control costs directly. They all control costs directly. They do not indulge in what I think is the fantasy that somehow the market will work in healthcare. It doesn't, it won't, and uh, to continue to uh, assume that it will uh, I think is just a huge mistake. Now, what form cost control takes is one we've got to work on. And there are lots of ways to approach it. But uh, I think we ought to scrap this notion that somehow there's a competitive marketplace in healthcare. There isn't. And as a matter of fact, as you probably know, even as we speak, hospitals and insurance companies are trying to consolidate further. Um, Where's the competition in that? So uh, I do think we're going to have to look, whether we like it or not, at ways to regulate costs in the system, take huge amounts of overhead costs which aren't contributing to health care at all and are costing us billions out of there and uh, get us health care which is not only good but which is affordable as well. So somebody like you can go out and get yourself a policy and uh, afford it. One possibility is the so-called public option, which Hillary and Senator Sanders supported when they were in the United States Senate, and uh, which she offered again. What's the public op option? Uh, especially for folks in middle age and beyond who are not yet eligible for Medicare, they would be able to buy into Medicare at cost, no subsidies, no taxpayer contribution but they would be able to buy a decent policy, comprehensive policy, which is what those of Medicare get, 
and they'd be able to do so at thousands of dollars less than you're currently paying. I don't know what your annual premium is, but um, if you could buy into Medicare, you'd get it for, oh, maybe 50 or 60% of what you're currently paying. Uh, now, be speaking of the economy, healthcare in general, if you are in the super rich, uh, I believe it was uh, George Bush, George W. Bush Jr. that implemented these tax breaks for the super rich. Why would you do such a thing when, for instance, if you're, uh, you know, a, a man who's trying to support your family and you make six figures, you pay more tax than your employer or someone living in poverty. How can we fix that? I'm not sure I understand. I mean, I think we generally support the notion in this country that that wealthy folks ought to pay more than poor folks. Exactly. As a percentage of their income. And uh, while there are some people apparently, uh, especially Donald Trump, who's been back and forth on this issue about 20 times, but who apparently is now back to the idea that the way to improve this country's economy is to... Uh, cut taxes again for the wealthy. I mean, how many times do we have to demonstrate that that's not the case? But uh, in any event, generally speaking, I think most Americans think that wealthy folks ought to pay a higher percentage of their income than, than middle-class folks or poor folks. And I think uh, that's a good principle and it's one that we ought to stick with. Um, so, um, you know, that's a major choice as well. I mean, there are dramatic differences between Hillary Clinton and and, and uh, Donald Trump when it comes to uh, who pays their fair share of taxes. And I think we know who's on the side of the wealthy and who thinks we need a decent and fair and equitable system. So that's going to be a major issue. And incidentally, let me also say this. Uh, this is going to be no cakewalk for Hillary Clinton. Uh, this is going to be a tough race. It's going to be a race that's going to require uh, a lot of work. And uh, my own feeling is, which I shared with the Clinton campaign, is that this has got to be a 50-state campaign, John. No exceptions. That's right. 200,000 precincts, each with a precinct captain. And the best grassroots organizational effort we've ever had in a presidential campaign. That's what this is going to take, and I hope and expect we're going to get it. Well, she's done far better than Trump in planning that ahead. I know she's... Uh raised through fundraisers or from the uh, Democratic uh, Party uh, over a billion dollars to get prepared because that's what Obama's campaign costs uh, for him to be elected. But you're absolutely right. That's something that uh, I don't think Donald Trump in any way uh, foresaw that because when he met, I believe it was with either New. Newt Gingrich or Karl Rove and asked, uh, uh, you know, what's it going to take for me to get from uh, t uh, 2015 to summer of 2016? And, uh, you know, they talked and the estimate was between 60, 80, maybe $100 million. And, you know, Trump thinks for about it. And his answer was, oh, a yacht. I mean, <laughs> what kind of person? you got to be extremely, extremely wealthy. But at the same time, do you really want someone who's never held office to come into the Oval, the highest office of this land? And I, obviously, he seems eager to, uh, you know, build up our military. I, I just see it as, you know... If he's elected, next thing you know, we're in war. Well, and let me say this. Uh, we are now spending more on the military than the next eight countries combined. That's right. That's we right. have 837 American bases in 150 countries. Don't ask me why. And moreover, the sad part, uh, incarceration, we lead the world for the amount of people that are incarcerated 
as well as uh, the percentage of the population. So, ah, uh, I I don't I don't want to say we're yeah, not only that. Uh, we need major public investments in this country. Our highway system is falling apart. We need high speed rail. We need excellent public transportation systems. We need uh, good schools. I mean, these public investments are investments in our future. And uh, nobody's going to tell me that spending $300 billion on a stealth bomber compares with those kinds of investments. In fact, I don't even know who the stealth bomber is supposed to attack. Do you? Correct. It's certainly not going to bother ISIS. It's and totally it's not, irrelevant. It's not going to help. Face it. It's not going to help us as average citizens. And you know, these public invents, investments not only build our economy, they create jobs for people. They right. produce and create a better quality of life for, for our citizens. So um, I don't know what Trump is talking about. We're not <laughs> spending enough on the military. Is he kidding? That's right. And, and you know what? I'm I'm so glad you brought up the transportation issue. Over there in New England, uh, where you are at the moment and where you are governor in Massachusetts, your transportation system is so much better and connected. I mean, I've met so many people from New York who are elderly who have never driven a car in their entire lives because they don't need one when living in New York, especially, I guess, uh, you know, Manhattan. Come to Los Angeles, as you know, you, no matter how much they expand these freeways, we're always clogged in traffic to go 20 miles from the valley to the city or to St. Sophia, uh, you know, Greek Orthodox Church, you know, it's not 20 miles, 20 minutes. You're talking, you know, an hour, maybe two. Well, as you know, changes in the air. The voters of Los Angeles County a few years ago voted to tax themselves by better than two-thirds to build a, a solid, regional, rail-based transit system, and it's under construction. And my hat's off to them, because uh, I don't have to tell you what Los Angeles traffic is like. Not only that, but as we all now know, if we spent any time out there, the smog is gone. The smog is gone in Los Angeles, John. That didn't happen by accident. It happened with a lot of tough regulation, a lot of hard work, and building a first-rate rail-based transit system will help that. That new transit system, which is, as you know, not only under construction, it's opening. I think the Expo line is going to be open, what, in a matter of a few days, a week, whatever, from downtown to Santa Monica, downtown to the sea, 16 miles, and that's just one of many of these new lines uh, is going to have a transformative effect on Los Angeles, and it was the voters of Los Angeles that, to their credit, in my opinion, we're willing to say, okay, we'll pay more if we can get ourselves a decent transit system so we can get off those freeways. Exactly. Um, but but these, this should be a national investment program. And, uh, I mean, people are now talking in the Pentagon about spending trillions to modernize our nuclear weapons. Are they kidding? I thought we were trying to get rid of them. Trillions to modernize our nuclear weapons. I mean, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And we need important and valuable and economy-building public investments in this country, and we need them now. It, not just now. We needed them yesterday, yesteryear, as opposed to spending trillions in, uh, in the defense budget. Like you said, the stealth bomber or whatever you know, classified aircraft they're using now, and I know drones are very popular, which actually is really saddening to know that a, a young kid fresh out of uh, high school joins the Air Force, goes into Nellis Air Force uh, Base in Nevada, sits in a bungalow, and, you know, almost plays like a video game, but instead he's dropping bombs and killing people. But the disconnect 
from him actually killing those people is not like it was 70 years ago or say the years of Sparta where you know the, the 300 Spartans with King Leonidas if you cut somebody with a sword you know you're seeing that blood and and the gruesomeness and the pain and the agony and the emotions that run through your head of taking someone's life no longer exist by having things such as these drones that are just literally like video games. Well, I don't know what's worth. All I know is that we're spending an enormous amount of money in the military to support hundreds of bases, hundreds of bases in 150 countries, and this 30 years after the end of the Cold War. Um, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And uh, I think we can do better. I think the American people want us to do better. And they want to spend a significant amount of that money on investment here at home. And that's what I hope and expect we will do. Agreed. Definitely agreed. Now, he, I'm only going to do two questions uh, that they were compiled over the year uh, since we last spoke. Uh, and again, like I said, your uh, last interview has gone uh, gone very well and has received a lot of positive comments. And I'm so glad that you were able to connect with the younger people, because even though the age range and the fact that this is an international show uh, is anywhere from teenagers to you know, people in their 70s, I think the average age right now is 45. The point being is people that are in their younger years, I never uh, really paid attention to politics as much as they do now, thanks to you. So here's a question I'm going to, I know the answer to, but I think it'd be best if you give it to them. Why is it we have an electoral college instead of popular vote and speaking of that, why do the Democrats have superdelegates? The number one complaint I get is that by having a superdelegate, the, you know, the saying one vote, uh, you know, one count, one vote matters uh, sort of takes that away. Well, let me start with this whole superdelegate thing. Um we came up, the Democrats came up with the notion of superdelegates because we found ourselves in some cases nominating candidates who couldn't win. And so the general consensus in the party was that in addition to delegates elected in the primaries, there ought to be some delegates who themselves had been elected, but not necessarily in the primaries, elected by their, the people of their districts, if they were members of Congress, uh, governors, if their states elected them, and so on. Um, and personally, I don't have a problem with that, because I think what you want is balance at the convention, recognizing, and I think it's important that people understand this, that those superdelegates almost overwhelmingly have been elected themselves. Uh, but that's where the superdelegates came from. I mean, if the party wants to change that is free to do so in subsequent elections but there's a reason for those superdelegates there's a history here and it's important for folks to understand it and then make up their own minds as to what they think we ought to do in the future uh, in my opinion john the electoral college should have been abolished 150 years ago uh, it was included in the constitution originally largely although the constitution itself was a remarkable do document the Electoral College is a profoundly anti-democratic institution. I mean, essentially, the framers of the Constitution didn't want even what at that time was a limited electorate. Remember, the electorate in 1789, when this country was first, first began, excluded women, excluded people of color, and excluded poor white men. So it was a very limited electorate. Even that limited electorate was something that the Founding Fathers didn't quite trust. So they wanted people to elect electors like themselves who would then make the decisions who the next president would be. 
That lasted until about 1825 in the period of Jacksonian democracy when people began demanding that the electors tell them who they were going to vote for in advance. And that's the system we have today. But why do we continue with that system? I mean, we've seen in one case, in the case of the Bush victory over Gore, that the guy that won the popular vote didn't become president. In a perfectly nonpartisan way, let me say that it would have been just as wrong if John Kerry had won Ohio in 2004 by 50,000 votes, and he would have become president, even though Bush got significantly more votes than he did in the popular vote. The system doesn't make any sense to me. I think we ought to get rid of it, uh, and let's have a popular vote, which represents the will of the majority of the American people. I mean, that's what we think we're doing when we vote in a presidential election. Unfortunately, what we are doing is, as you know, electing electors. Yes. And that's the reason that Bush, despite the fact that he didn't win the popular vote, became the president of the United States. And I think, if I may say, the worst president of my lifetime. And you're not the only person or the only pop, uh, politician who has told me that. And uh, not to mention uh, listeners, uh, people you run across on the street. I, you know, I definitely agree with you there. Uh, how he won, you know, how he was reelected is beyond me. But nonetheless, uh, here's the well, other question I wanted to ask you. Now, this encompasses several people's questions, but this uh, I'm going to ask it the way Sean Stone who is a filmmaker, producer, investigative reporter. Uh, he hosts Buzzsaw as well as Russia Today's RT's show, Watching the Hawks. When he heard your last interview, he wanted... Uh, we definitely need unification on this earth because this primitive tribal warfare needs to stop. But at the same time, he wanted to know what was your your definition exactly of having a new world order, uh, which you said we, you agreed with George Herbert Walker Bush, probably one of the few things you agreed with him to begin with, right? Let me say this. Uh, I thought Bush one was a, was a fine foreign policy president. I thought he was a lousy domestic president, but I thought he was a fine foreign policy president. And one of the reasons for that was that he believed in what he called a new world order, meaning what? Meaning a world that would be governed by rules and a code of conduct that nations would be expected to support, observe, and comply with. What kind of example are we talking about? Well, I think the nuclear agreement with Iran. Yes. Remember, we have an international treaty and an organization to enforce it, which seeks to stop the proliferation of nuclear weapons in this country, in this world, and actually cut back. And it has done so. Um, some countries, North Korea in particular, apparently don't want to pay any attention to it. Uh, Iran, however, um, was skirting the edges of this thing. And... Uh, with the strong support of the UN and the Security Council, including Russia and China, we now have an agreement which appears to be working with Iran under which uh, they will not be permitted to develop a nuclear arsenal and they will be subject to extensive investigation uh, and policing. And so far they seem to be complying with the agreement. That's uh, right. That's the kind of new world order that I think George H.W. Bush believed in. And, and I, it was the same kind of uh -huh. new world order that he talked about when, in fact, he rallied virtually, John, the entire international community, including the vast majority of Middle Eastern countries, in stopping Iraq's invasion and expansion into Kuwait. Um, that's what I mean. And I think that's what he means when we're talking about a new world order, a, 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 a world in which there are rules, there are codes of conduct, and we expect people and nations to observe them, 
and there's machinery to enforce that. Uh, that's the kind of world that I think we've got to be working towards. Especially to the example you gave with nuclear weapons and North Korea. Uh, that that should be, uh, at minimum, a universal uh, rule that I hope every country in the United Nations can come together and implement such a deal, along with so many others. So that was a very well said answer. Uh, I definitely would love to hear you back after the elections, but in uh, hang by until uh, after we're over. But let me ask you this. Uh, I know you're short on time, and if you had, there's so many other topics we could talk about, but I, again, I don't want to keep you. If you had one final message to all the listeners, what would you have to say? Global. Remember, this is international. This may sound idealistic, John, but I think we are closer than at any time in world history to that day when war is ruled out as a means for settling disputes between and among countries. And I really mean that. We're not there yet. I may not see it in my lifetime. I hope and expect my kids will, and that my grandkids will enjoy that kind of world. Now, what is it going to take to help build a world in which war is ruled out as a means for settling disputes between and among countries? A strong United Nations, a strong set of rules, codes of conduct, call them what you will, and the machinery to enforce them. And I think most of the nations and the overwhelming majority of people in this world want that kind of world. And I want my country to be leading that effort. And I hope we will. Well said and agreed. We do need unification. I mean, humans are brothers and sisters, no matter where you live on this planet. And you're right. The U.S. should be leading it. Everybody, Governor Michael Dukakis, uh, still staying young and definitely sharp and a big influence in politics. I truly hope you enjoyed this interview. And don't worry, of course, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Dukakis will be back, as you heard him say, or not on this show, on other shows that he is listening to Dr. J Radio Live. So first again, of course, I always want to thank, in order, my guest, a former POTUS candidate, professor at Northeastern University, as well as UCLA, former governor of Massachusetts, who uh, ran against George Herbert Walker Bush in 1988. We have, of course, thanks to Michael Dukakis. I also want to thank my team, Johnny Webb, always staying awake very late to do a lot of stuff on the show and not to mention off the show. He's a great asset, and I'm very happy to have him, as well as Tom, again, on the show and off the show. I don't know if you guys understand how much work goes behind the scenes. Not to mention Lou Sheehan. Got to thank him for the work he's been doing behind the scenes for making Dr. J Radio Live possible, not to mention all the other people who I have not mentioned. Also, don't let me forget to tell you that you can catch these archives when they finally make the rounds from all the networks, which include PSN Radio, uh, Late Night in the Midlands, and D Program Radio based in the United Kingdom, set up, of course, by Johnny Webb, not to mention the AM and FM stations that carry this show worldwide. Uh, you can see all those links and everything on our website, which is drjradiolive.com. The same name for every social media account. That is facebook.com slash drjradiolive. Uh, YouTube.com, where we have our archives, as youtube.com slash drjradiolive. Instagram, Twitter, Flickr, Tumblr, Pinterest, Google+, Plus. Uh, I already said Facebook, YouTube, uh, Gmail even, our website, Slack, Things I don't even know. The point is, you only need to remember Dr. J Radio Live, DRJ Radio Live. With that being said, final people I want to thank are you, guys and gals, ladies and gentlemen, the audience. If it wasn't for you, we would not be doing this show. Remember, knowledge is power, disclosure is in your hands. Everything you learn, this is what you have to take 
You could take it with a grain of salt or it could be mind blowing to you. But all we do is try to present information to you. With that being said, don't forget, finally, a couple of our specials and sponsors going on from our previous guests. We have Zox Pro System. All you have to do is mention Dr. J when purchasing it to learn how you can I basically have photographic memory. I, as Apollo 14 astronaut Edgar Mitchell told me before he passed away, because he was their spokesperson, that it works. And the Watchers 10 special, you get almost $60 off. Uh, for $39.99, you get Watchers 10. You get uh, Watchers, I don't remember, I think 7 is the other one. But there's another one that you get. So you get two. You also get Ellie Marzulli's latest book, a year subscription to... Um, I think it's Paranormal Prophecy and Supernatural, something like that, PPS, and much, much more. Just click on that link. If you want to register domains, our webmaster's already started doing that, Tom Schaefer, so don't hesitate to, you know, jump on that. And, of course, that would happen to be all our sponsors, my team. Thank you, audience. Thank you, guest. Thank you, Johnny, for being up so late and all working, and Tom, and... Uh, thank you all for joining us t again tonight. We will see you soon. Again, just go to drjradiolive.com to see who the next guest is coming on. We don't release one week at a time. We release one night at a time. If you want to find out Tuesday's guest, hop on Monday. You want to hop on, you want to see who's coming on that Thursday? Unfortunately, unless you hear from somebody else, you will have to look at the website on Wednesday night. As soon as the shows finish each night, the next night's guest pop up. The show is live Tuesday through Thursday, as you know, 7 p.m. PT, 10 p.m. Eastern Time, and where London, Johnny is in London, 3 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, right here on our very own Coast to Coast PM radio network, and then is on all throughout the different hours on all the other networks as this show is spread around the world. Uh, that is a lot of information to, for you to digest. But remember, folks, just one word, one phrase that you need to remember. That is Dr. J Radio Live. With that, I am Dr. J, and we are signing off for the night. <laughs> This is George Tsoukalos, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. These creatures are very, very strange. They're anomalous. It is the age of revelations. Bizarre creatures. False perception of reality exposed. Just go to the Dr. J's, you know, website. You'll see it on the left-hand side. It's like right there. Click the link. Um, you know, guys, what can I tell you? I mean, it, it's forty dollars, but you get a DVD and a book plus three three bonuses: uh, communion CD, a year subscription to our Politics, Property, and Supernatural magazine, which comes in your email box. Watchers 3, which is 20 bucks for that DVD. Fingerprints of the Supernatural. We promise you, you will not be disappointed. And Dr. J gets a cut of the proceeds. So everybody's happy. You support him. You support us. And, it, and it's all good. And you get to educate yourself on what's going on because we've just scratched the surface here. Trust me. I'm Richard C. Hoagland, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live.
Torpedo impact now, 40 seconds. Torpedo impact, 25 seconds. I'm Art Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live.